novel. What we probably thought of a novel prior to 2020. A book. But it's 2020 and we know novel means something else. It means new. Why? Because we had the novel coronavirus. Hey, first. Our next guest is a novel director. Although he had years of experience in film, he just made his first feature length film, The Mortuary Collection. His name is Ryan Spindell. And guys, this is another episode of Film Nation. Lessons from a first time novel director. Hi guys, welcome back to class one more time. Today our guest speaker is Ryan Spindell. Uh, Ryan just directed, uh, just directed his first full length feature film, The Mortuary Collection on Shudder. And uh, when I watched it, I, this, is, this is my quick review of it. It would be like Edgar Allan Poe writing ghost stories for Will Ferrell to star in. <laughs> it was it's a nice there's a, a lot of old feeling ghost stories but has a great sense of uh of modern humor to it and it's a wonderful film ryan thank you so much for being a part of our class today thank you for having me and thank you for that awesome intro i'm going to get get you to come with me and uh pitch my aesthetic to every meeting i go to happy to do so enjoy <laughs> yeah so uh and guys if you haven't seen it yet you you definitely need a shutter has seven days for free so there you go um, all right, Ryan, as um, writer, director, producer of the Mortuary Collection, um, you were with a filmmaker that was with it from the very beginning to the very end. Now, you know, a lot of times screenwriters, we've already had a conversation with a screenwriter, you know, he punches his thing, he gives it to the studio, he's done. Actors come, they do their call, they're done. Same thing with other cast and crew members, but you, you were with this from the first typing of that word to the actual, um, distribution of shutter. What was that timeline process? Just if you don't mind going to explain how long did that take? What was that process like? Oh, it took a long time. Uh, I like how you mentioned uh, the shorter run times of the, the screenwriters and the actors. Uh, I'm so envious of them at times because they sort of, especially actors who sort of show up when everything's built and ready to go and they perform and uh, not to take anything away from them, their job is incredibly difficult. It's something I could never do. Uh, but they sort of, they do their scenes and they walk away and then uh, us uh, directors have to sort of put our head down and go into another six months to a year of uh, post-production just to finish the thing. So I, I often see those people who, who swing in and do their thing and take off and I, I'm envious. Um, this movie is um, different than a lot of films, even as far as independent films go, this movie was a labor of love and uh, a, a marathon to say the least. Um, I wrote this movie in 2012, so wow. eight years ago, going on nine years ago, I wrote the film. Uh, and the first thing I did is, is I had made a lot of shorts in the past and uh, I love short format. I think the short format's a beautiful thing that often gets overlooked. I think a lot of people think of shorts as stepping stones to something bigger um, and they can be, but for my taste, I think shorts are uh, something wonderful in their own right. And uh, it's something that I was sort of working exclusively in for a long time. And um, I decided to make a feature film that sort of showcased that format uh, and sort of, you know, can kind of take a bunch of different really cool shorts and package them in a, in sort of a, into one movie that could find a larger audience. Um, and so I wrote uh, the initial script in 2012, uh, being five stories. And then, as is often the case when you're a new filmmaker, it's really tricky to get people to trust in you that you can take a project that's on the page and execute it, even even with a whole bunch of shorts under my belt. Right. Um, so what I decided to do is I wanted to make another short to keep working because uh, as a filmmaker, the most important thing you can keep doing is keep making things, keep realizing things. And so I got together with some of my collaborators and I said, let's take one of these shorts from this feature and make it as a proof of concept to show people exactly what the movie's going to be like. So we did a little Kickstarter campaign back in 2014, I think, and we raised a little bit of money and we made uh, one of the stories from the feature, which is called The Babysitter Murders. And 
the babysitter murders we went to a bunch of festivals we won some awards we met a bunch of cool people and eventually we found the financing to make uh the rest of the movie now traditionally you know you would make a, you would get a sort of a piece of money you would schedule the movie you would shoot for on a film at this size you would probably shoot for two to three weeks um, but as we started meeting with line producers, the line producer is essentially the person that says how you're going to spend your money, how to budget it in a way that works. Mm -hmm. And the line producer said, um, there's no way you can make this movie for anything less than four times the amount of money you have. It's just an impossible feat. Don't even try. And so uh, me and my collaborators we had this moment where we were sitting there with a little bit of money, but four times less than we needed to actually make the film. And we said, we don't buy it. I mean, Hollywood is full of people telling you that uh, you can't do something for A, B, and C, but mm -hmm. filmmaking is also an art form and art is subjective and the way you go about it can be, you could sort of blaze your own path and so many of my favorite filmmakers did it that way. So I said, look, we can't make one big feature for this amount of money, but we know how to make shorts, we know how to make them really well and we know how to make them cheaply. Let's just start shooting these sort of shorts one at a time and you know we'll figure it out and so that's exactly what we did so from there it took us about two years kind of shooting oh, wow. uh this movie in sort of segments so we had a couple of like kind of larger segments where we had about a 40 person crew we had sort of legit equipment and all of the sort of bells and whistles that uh, a low budget indie would but then we did several more shoots maybe six or seven shoots over the next year and a half that were sometimes just me my producer and a camera and a stand-in actor or uh, there's a scene where there's um, little skeleton kids and we needed some hands. So my friend's son, who was two years old, came over and put on the, uh, the skeleton glove and, and did some hand work for us. And uh, wrangling a two-year-old is very difficult. And I wouldn't suggest doing that uh, on your film. Um, but it really sort of was a labor of love in, in, in the best and worst ways in that um, it's a long time to be making a movie for, for anybody. And uh, luckily I was surrounded with some really special people that went above and beyond to make it. And um, what's interesting about the filmmaking process is uh, it really sort of, you know, it's an industry where you can run into a lot of crackpots, um, but it's also an industry where you can find a lot of amazing people and they really can come out of the woodwork and, and come to your aid when you need them. And that, that was probably the most rewarding part of the whole process. And, and you mentioned several times a labor of love. And again, guys, I mean, I've seen this movie and it is, it is a love story to the horse. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you were, you were giving a, a love letter to uh, horror films. That's correct. That's correct. It's, it's, it's kind of a few different things. It's a, it's a love letter to the, the horror films of the past that I love. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a love letter to um, stories and storytellers. So there's kind of a, a, a double whammy going on there. Uh, and I guess you sort of have to see the movie to, to understand it. Um, but it really kind of celebrates um, the genre and, and the people that work within the genre and the sort of passion uh, that it takes to, to make these stories come to life. Well, as you were making it, and you, you said you started it in 2012 with writing it, and you, you did your grad work at Florida State, and you've been making shorts since 2007. Been working with film <laughs> since 2007. This was your first feature. Uh, what lesson, after, even though you've had all this experience, what lesson on this film, this first feature film, were you like, dag on it? Why, why should I, I should have known this one kind of thing? Uh, was there a lesson moment like that that you learned something valuable? I mean, yeah, I, I think that, uh, man, that's always a tough question to answer because every second of every day when you're making a film feels like 30 lessons. Okay. Um, but this one in particular, I, I feel like you almost read a book on lessons that sort of everything from small micro things to larger macro things. Um, but a big takeaway, and I think this for this particular project, because it took so long to, to execute and because um, it required several of these creative people. See, as a director, I'm sort of the, the captain of the ship and it's kind of my baby. And so I, a lot of it is, is leaning on me um to sort of see it over the finish line but there are several other people who worked on the film who weren't it wasn't their baby they were, they were sort of working on my baby and trying to help me get it across to the finish line and the fact that some of those people stuck around for years on end mm. to do it is, is something really uh really astounding to me and and something that i i sort of 
seek to do in my life when I'm helping other people with films too. And that's kind of what you find out uh, working in the industry is that it's sort of a give and take. You, you can't just take and take and take, you have to sort of give it back and you have to sort of help your community. And so I think for this film more than any other, my biggest takeaway is, is, is find your tribe, F find the people um, that believe in movies as strongly as you do or believe in the types of movies you make and help each other rise up in the ranks together. Because you know this medium uh, more than almost any other requires people. You, 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 you can't, you know, unless you're making stop motion animation by yourself in your room, you, need, you literally just need people to make movies. And if you want to make great movies, you need great people. Yeah. So um, one of my biggest regrets, I think, is that uh, I was late to the to making films because when I was in high school, um, I, was, I didn't have a community of people that help, would help me make films. And I could have found them, but instead I decided just not to make things. I decided to just hang out with my friends and, and, and be a degenerate and, and sort of not, not do the work. And my biggest regret now as an adult filmmaker is I wish I'd used that time and sort of the resources I had back then to to make stuff at an early age because you, you want to get you want to get started as early as possible in an industry as competitive as this one. Now you, you're talking about having this community of people, and it's a perfect segue. Um, you know, Steven Spielberg, Jaws. There, when he actually made Jaws, he his editor uh, became very much he will recognize as a mentor to him. Um, was there an editor or somebody in this community that was like a mentor to you? Or was this a, as you said, a, just a community experience? Uh, uh, and is it important to have a mentor on a film? I, I think uh, I did not have a mentor per se. Right. Um, and I do think that if, if you can find a mentor, if you have access to a mentor, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And, and, men, and some people have entire careers because of their mentors. But I do think also it's important to note that even if you don't have a, men don't have a mentor, that shouldn't discourage you right. from becoming a filmmaker because the amount of resources that are out there now, uh, especially with uh, the internet, yeah. is, um, is staggering. I mean, you can, uh, I, I didn't have the internet growing up. And uh, so my resource for learning about film was weird books that I would find at the bookstore, which makes me feel very old saying that out loud. Um, <laughs> But the fact that you can learn anything now uh, just by logging uh, online is, is incredible. And, and to this day, I'm always on YouTube. I, I'm always watching other filmmakers, uh, sort of discussions about the film process, aesthetics. Um, so I think that, um, you know, if you don't have a mentor, but you want to be a filmmaker, you can go out there and you can, you can take advantage of the, the millions of mentors that are already putting stuff out there. And um, I would start with uh, this one called Every Frame of Painting which is uh, just one of the best YouTube uh, filmmaking series that uh, I've ever seen. And what, what was that YouTube channel again? Uh, it's called Every Frame of Painting. Every Frame of Painting, okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and it can lead you down the rabbit hole to all the other sort of places to at least get you started and kind of getting, uh, getting a, a, a handle on sort of the more artistic side of film. On the artistic aspect, uh, once you realize you, you had your film in a can, You've sent it off to Shutter, uh, and then you watch it again. Uh, was there a thing that you now look back and like, "Dag on it, uh, I could have done this better," or "I wish I would have done this," or, or "Are you, are you just like, this was a perfect submission? I'm, I'm pleased with." It. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, it's absolutely perfect. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this: anybody who says their film is perfect, I wouldn't trust that person. Uh, it is uh, the irony of making a film, especially a feature film, is that you watch this two hour film a million times. By the time you're sort of finished and you're off to the festivals, you kind of don't ever want to watch it again because you're, it's impossible for you to see. I, you can sometimes see some of the bits and pieces that came together in the way you like, but for the most part, it's just like torturing yourself because you're watching just sort of a series of things that you'd wish you'd done differently. Right. Um, uh, and, and so I think I think it's just it's sort of sad that part of the process is that you never want to watch your work again. You make it exclusively for others, and then you walk away. Um, but there is something really amazing about being in a theater and having people respond to the movie and having it work for people in the way you intended. That even if you can't quite see it, you can feel it. That right. is like 
it's like a drug. You, it just brings you back. It makes you want to make it again. It makes you want to do things. It makes you want to move people uh, through the medium of cinema. But if I had to pick a specific thing about this movie off the top of my head, um, I would say uh, puppets. If you're working with puppets, if you're working at the end of the movie, for those who have seen it, there is an entire sequence that's driven by uh, child, puppet children. Um, and I had thought that using puppets would be a very easy thing. And I scheduled about two hours to do it. And as <laughs> soon as we started animating the puppets on set, I was like, oh, we're gonna need like four days to do this. And so we basically had to sort of kind of piece it together with the little scraps we were able to pull off. So if you wanna do puppets or, or any kind of effect, actually I would say any kind of special effect that involves a gore gag or a, light, a tricky light sort of gag or something specific, you need to schedule that ahead of time and, and leave yourself ample time to get it right. Now, um, you've talked about, you know, you learned this stuff through um, reading books. The guys nowadays, you're right. They, they have, there's so many YouTube channels out there. Um, I grew up, uh, since this is a horror film, automatically fell in love with it because uh, I love the genre, but I grew up, as a kid in the high school in the 80s and I, you know I was a fan of Wes Craven and John Carpenter uh, because they were pioneers in the slasher genre. Do you have any were any of these guys any of these 80s filmmakers 90s filmmakers influential on on this film that you made and do you have like winks or easter eggs uh, of in of towards them in your film? Oh yeah I mean yes yes a thousand times over. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about, about making a film like this, um, it's an anthology film, right? So it has five different stories and each story is kind of uh, playing with different subgenres. And it kind of gave me this wide open canvas to really experiment and kind of put all of my influences into it. I, I call it a kitchen, a kitchen sink movie because I just sort of did everything I love all in one place. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the same filmmakers you mentioned were huge influences on me. Um, some of the, the the really pivotal ones was uh, Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi's early stuff and yeah. Peter Jackson's stuff. I love mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, but prior to Lord of the Rings, right. um, those movies really, uh, in particular, Dead Alive was a was a one that sort of made me want to make movies to begin with. Okay. Um, there's a really wonderful French filmmaker named Jean Pierre Junet who is famous for making the movie Amelie. But yes. He, also made a couple of much darker, much stranger movies prior to Amelie that have this really incredible French uh, design heavy aesthetic that I, I always loved and I always wanted to sort of fuse into the horror genre. And then of course, Steven Spielberg has tendrils in every single thing I've ever done. I just think, uh, especially again, his older stuff uh, that was more geared towards younger audiences. That's the kind of thing that I, I'm really drawn to. So. The movie is full of uh, Easter eggs. There, there's, I, I don't talk about too many of them um, because I think it, it's so much fun to find them in repeated viewings. But I think one of, um, one of the more obvious ones is that uh, the fourth story in the movie is called The Babysitter Murders, yeah. um, which was originally the title for John Carpenter's Halloween uh, prior to him changing it to Halloween. Uh, so that's a nice nod and a wink to, uh, to what that movie is and sort of the, the kind of meta commentary that the, the film has as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Out of your short stories that are in that film, that was the one that resonated with me the most because it, it is very much, uh, I, I saw a lot of winks uh, to John Carpenter in, in that short story. And um, I was like, it's, it's, it's true. Oh, it's, it's interesting because the, um, the genesis of that one in particular was that I was, I, I'm a huge horror fan, obviously. Um, I'm kind of, my favorite subgenre is uh, monster, monster movies. Okay. But um, I remember I had, I was sitting in a coffee shop one day and I was thinking about how slasher movies were my least favorite subgenre because to me, they were like the romantic comedy of horror. They're, they're too predictable, too tropey, uh, and, and they just didn't interest me. Um, I, just, I, I just, teenagers getting butchered in the woods wasn't really my thing. I'm more of a fantasy guy. Um, but as I was thinking about the tropes of that subgenre, uh, the idea for the Babysitter Murders kind of sprang up to me, and it, was, uh, it felt so good that I was like, okay, this will be my take on a slasher movie. It's sort of like 
and the initial script was almost like poking fun at how base I thought slasher films were. But in the process of making that short, I did a bunch of research and I watched a lot of slasher movies, including Halloween, probably 20 times. And in the process of doing my research, I kind of fell in love with the subgenre. Okay. Um, and the and the movie sort of veered away. The short is veered away from something that was poking fun at slashers to something that was celebrating them. Uh, and that's sort of just one of the perks of the process is that um, I get to watch scary movies for work. Uh, now you just mentioned that you were having fun poking fun, and you, and the film has a lot of humor in it. it it's 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 part comedy and, and it's part sure. horror film. You're tackling probably the two most difficult genres to do because comedies are, you either land the joke and the timing with it or you don't and it falls flat. And horror, you're either creating that sense of dread or you're boring your audiences. And, and you decided to take both tropes and mix them together as a first feature film. I mean, did, did you ever question yourself on that? Or were you like, no, I got this? Um, I, I didn't question it because uh, horror is my favorite genre, but I'm just naturally, I think, uh, I'm drawn towards comedy in, okay. in my writing, especially. I like to write comedy. Um, and and the, the, two, the two genres are, are so similar. They're, they're really about yeah. subverting expectation. They're about surprise. It's, it's a different kind of surprise, uh, but it's all about the sort of the setup and then the, the twist. And um, in a way, it, while it seems like it might be difficult to blend the two, in a way it's kind of uh, a safety net because if a joke doesn't land, I can still say, well, it's still a horror movie. I wasn't supposed to make you laugh. It's just supposed to be kind of funny. Uh, and if the horror doesn't land, I can say, well, it's kind of a comedy. Like, lighten up, have fun with it. So it, it, it kind of, doing both at the same time, I think uh, is easier. And I actually think just doing straight horror would be easier than straight comedy. Straight comedy, uh, terrifies me. I do not. I do not think that I have the guts to yeah. ride on a joke and and then go to a screening and sit there and have people not laugh and just sort of lose uh, all of my faith in, in myself and humanity as a whole. Uh, if you want to really test yourself, uh, you could try online teaching in front of a a, a bunch of <laughs> icons on a screen, and when you go throw a joke out and none of them are laughing back. <laughs> Come on. That's funny. <laughs> um, now, my students, uh, they are a part of a generation that is unlike any other filmmaking generation. Um, as you said, you had to read about it. Um, and then you had to study it and, and maybe even use the old eight millimeter kind of tapes on your first kind of productions. I'm this not that old. Hold up, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But this generation, they have their phones uh, and they are constantly being filmmakers. Um, they're, they're putting on short stories on TikTok. They're selling stories on Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, I mean, they are becoming creators and actually they're, you know, TikTok and YouTube, you know, marks it as become a creator. Um, so again, this is a generation unlike any other generation prior uh, so there's probably some future filmmakers that uh, could very well be watching this from this class uh, that are, you know, practicing with this. Um, what advice as a first time filmmaker yourself, but somebody that's been in the industry for a while, what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers that are using their phones right now? Well, first off, I think that seems really intimidating and scary. The, the fact that you're uh, of an age where you have such access to the, the resources you need to make something and everyone's telling you, just make it. You can, you got a movie in your pocket, just go out there and make it. I feel like that's a little overwhelming of the amount of pressure to put on a generation. I think uh, we come from a generation where we had all these excuses for why we weren't making things all the time. Uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge that first and foremost, that um, every generation of filmmaker has uh, complained that the generation after it has had more resources. That's sort of been how it has been from the beginning of time. Um, you know, back when I was young, the complaint was, uh, you know, equipment's too expensive. And mm. now people complain, um, oh, equipment's not expensive, but uh, there's the, it's too saturated. There, there, there's no room to put anything out there. Everyone's making stuff and nobody cares. Um, so I think the problems remain the same. It all sort of 
comes down to uh, you know using the tools and allowing yourself um, to fail, it, allowing yourself to practice, yeah. and allowing yourself to make mistakes and to work your way through uh, the medium to to find your voice as a filmmaker. Because when you you know when you have the best editing software and the best camera and the best lens and they're all in your pocket. I think the, the, the feeling might be that I have to go out there and I have to make something wonderful and something fantastic right off the top because what excuse do I have? And it just doesn't work like that. It's, it's if you want to be an illustrator, you have to draw for you know, thousands of drawings before you can find your way to sort of being uh, good at it. And the same goes, um, I think, for with filmmaking or, or with the medium. I mean, um, I would sort of start with finding filmmakers that you love. I would, I would watch the movies you love, but I'd also seek out short films online. Short of the week is a really great uh, uh, resource. So you can kind of see how people make shorts and see what other people are doing within that sort of medium. And then start sort of, you know, you start imitating the things you like and then start expanding on it and finding your way to it. And don't let the, the pressures of everyone telling you that you, you should be making something amazing because you have all the, all the resources right there uh, hold you back. Because again, that is something that I, that I did as a young person is I, I knew I wanted to make films, but I, my excuse was that I, I don't have people to help me uh, and I, I don't have the, the cameras to make them work. But, but I did, I had, my parents had a camera and I could, have, I could have brought my siblings in and, and I could have made stuff. I, I could have found my way um, to practicing. And what you'll find out is as you start to practice and as you start to uh, see the footage you are making, um, an excitement will start to grow and it won't feel like work. It feels like everything you want to do. You, you just, you just buy your time until you can do it again. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, but, yeah. I, but I, and actually I think you shared something that was very key, but I, I want to touch back on it because you were saying it's okay to fail. Um, now I prefer they, they don't fail my class. <laughs> That's not good, but, but yeah, I mean, on experiencing this, um, I mean, how many failures do you think you've had since you've been working on this since 2012, from 2012 to 2020? How many, I mean, how many failures and trips did you fall uh, on this story? Constantly. I mean, even in the movie that I have out now, it's a, to, to me, it's a series of, of, of fails because um, you're always growing and you're always expanding as a filmmaker. And that's kind of the life that you, you set out for when you want, when you want to be an artist, but it's also, uh, you're always growing and, and changing and becoming a better version of yourself, which is just something really special. And and for for somebody that you know that did fall, you've you've created something very wonderful for your debut feature there. Thank so. you, thank you. All right, so we're now to the point of uh, where we when we close up, we close up with five quick questions. Uh, if you're ready to play this part of the, the interview here, um, it's just it. sort of quick association. Uh, words and thoughts that come to these questions here so okay boom boom boom, boom no wrong answer by the way so okay all right all right question number one uh what went through your mind the moment you found out that shutter was going to pick up and release uh her film? i was initially uh a little bit nervous about it if i'm going to be honest because i think as a filmmaker you grow up or you come to with this idea that Netflix is where you want to be because everyone has Netflix. And when you make a movie, I can tell my grandmother to watch Netflix. My grandmother has Netflix. And I know that Shudder is a bit more of a, of a niche a niche service and a lot of people don't have it. I have it. Um, so my initial fear was uh, that the movie wouldn't reach the audience that I wanted it to, um, in particular non-horror fans. Um, but since then, since the year between them picking it up and us releasing it, um, obviously this pandemic has happened and, and changed the world as we know it. And uh, I'm, I'm realizing now that Shudder is the best place for a movie like this because the, the service has about a million subscribers and those subscribers watch every single thing on Shudder. And the fact that any movie is on Shudder is going to be watched by a million people at least. And that's probably the best thing anyone can ask for uh, as a filmmaker. You just recently made a pitch, uh, and congratulations on that part. On a scale of one to 10, with one, you're as cool as walking into a walk-in fridge, and 10 being, I think I'm gonna continuously do exorcism vomit. Um, 
what level of anxiety are you on making pitches? When you're making that pitch, where are you at on that scale of 1 to 10? Oh, man. Uh, which one was the vomit one? 10? 10. 10. Uh-huh. Ten. Exorcism uh, and vomit at that level, too. At 10. Uh, I, I, at this point, I'm probably at about a three or four. Oh, nice. Um, but I will say this. Uh, I am not and nor have I ever been a person that is a salesman. I've always been a, a creative. I've always was an artist. I was a, would draw quietly by the old willow tree as a child. And I was as much much more of a of an art person than a, than a salesman. And when I moved to L.A., uh, the biggest fear was that I was going to have to become some kind of hustler or huckster to make it in this industry. Um, and that just wasn't the case. Uh, what was the case is just experience. This kind of comes back to, to making things and failing. I took so many meetings where I was spewing exorcist vomit on all of the walls the entire time. Uh, but then somewhere after doing 30 or 40 of them, it started to become normal. And after doing a hundred of them, I could kind of do it okay. And, and now I'm actually pretty good at it. I still feel a little bit of thunderstorm on the inside, but I, I seem cool and collective on the outside. Uh, and that was one of the biggest learning experiences for me of this career is that you don't have to be a certain type of person to be a filmmaker. You just have to be willing to grow and adapt and practice. Wow. All right, question four uh, is, on on the next three options I'm going to give you, which is the worst and why? Financing the film, writing the screenplay, or reading the critical responses? Ooh, that's a good question. I love these questions. Um, ooh, wow, those are all so, so hard. Um, I'm going to say... I'm gonna say it's writing the film. Uh, okay. I want to say financing, but I think that's sort of a boring answer. And I want to talk about writing because I think each of those things you're talking about have moments where they seem okay and moments where it feels like the end of your life. Okay. And there is something about while writing at a coffee shop on your computer seems like the least stressful thing in the world when there's 60 people waiting for that draft and that draft has to be artistically wonderful and it has to fix all the problems that they've laid out for you in the meeting and it just has to be done and you it's not coming and you have to sort of will it to its existence uh there's something so lonely and uh terrible about that moment that you know you don't have a choice but to just work through it and again and this comes back to the meeting thing i think those moments are the moments where you grow the most, when you're just, you have no choice but to push yourself to pull off something that feels impossible. And you come out the other side and you're just a little bit better. And if you do that a hundred times, uh, you can make a movie. Um, I was figuring that, uh, you know, my gut reaction was probably going to, if I was going to wager, I would have wagered reading reviews of critics, but uh, I, I like this answer with this screen. <laughs> I've been lucky. I've been lucky that I haven't made something yet that's been destroyed by critics. So uh, ask me when I make something that gets eaten alive, and I probably have a totally different answer. Uh, question four: uh, The actor you would literally kill to have star in your uh, star in your film. You'd kill for them to be able to star in your next film. If it's an actor who's died, does that mean that they come back to life? No, no, like you'd be like, if you're like, <laughs> if you're like all right, I'll do your film. I need you to go kill this person for me, but I'll, I'll do it if you get that done. You would be, oh. you'd be willing to kill for, to star in your film. Uh, I mean, I had to kill uh, three people to get Clancy Brown to be in the movie. So I guess I've already been there and done that and totally worth it. He <laughs> is a wonderful human being. All right, all right. Which leads me to my next question, our final question. Uh, who would you like to invite into our class for our next discussion? Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Krabs himself, the wonderful Clancy Brown. All right, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, who's, who is one of the, the, in essence, the narrator of your film, um, 
and uh, very star. I would say the star. He is he is the the the, the keystone of the entire movie, and uh, and uh, the movie would not be the same without him. And if you love SpongeBob SquarePants, you are really going to love the Mortuary Collection. So, <laughs> and the just to go with your Mortuary Collection and his role, not giving it any way, the the twist that you have that culminate at the end. Mm-hmm. Well done, well done. I Thank did not you. see that one coming. I was, I was, and I normally feel like I'm pretty, pretty um, have a key eye for like, ah, this is how this is going to do. So, but, so excited to have Clancy Brown. Thank you for inviting him. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Krabs. Uh, <laughs> he's all Star Wars, Clone Wars, Shawshank Redemption, Highlander. Man, so. man. you got to get him to do the voice. You can, you, you can ask him to do the voice. He'll do it. He won't get mad, I promise. All right. Well, Brian, <laughs> congratulations on your film. Thank you so much for spending time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been really cool. I feel honored to be a part of your class. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Always more tells. Indeed, there have been. And one day soon, perhaps I'll tell you another. Ryan Spindell, thank you so much for joining our class. Thank you for sharing your wisdom as a first-time novel director. I truly appreciate it, and I know on behalf of my entire class, they do as well. Guys, as always, thank you for being who you are. I know these times are difficult, but I appreciate that you're plowing through this. And as always, guys, Remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Really? It's a good book. It's four short stories. You should read it. Shawshank Redemption, right there. It's in there. Happy Pupil, The Body, Winter's Tale. Watch it. Read it. Read it. Don't watch it. Read it. See you guys. This poor soul's journey has come to an end. From dust we started, to dust we return. Every corpse tells a story. It is our task to listen. So these are all stories about how people died. Some tales even I find too unsettling to recount. She's dead! You gotta get that body out of your apartment. Keep your doors locked tonight and keep an eye out for crazies. The monster! That's pretty cool. Yes, it is, isn't it? There's no use running. Your story is just beginning.